oh, well, cool. We should kick more things around here, right? <laughs> um, good morning. No, seriously, really? Good morning. good morning. There you go. All right, youth, you're dismissed. Utes, beat it. Get out of here. Yes, they're youths. All right, um, uh, looking at your, your bulletin, uh, one of the things that we see is um, we have men's discipleship uh, this coming Tuesday at 7. Um, Wednesday is ec- we're back in Exodus. Uh, Friday is U-turn. There you go. And then, of course, next Sunday is prayer and worship. And the reason we put next Sunday on there is because sometimes we want you to be prepared for things like um, Beehive uh, or other ministries that are going on that following Sunday. Um, oh, I accidentally left communion potluck in there. I didn't let Liz look at this before I printed it, so that's my fault. Mark out that communion potluck. Unless you just want to have your own, then go for it. But do remember, guys of you, next Sunday is Valentine's Day. Be prepared. You have been warned. It is, it is out there, right? Um, and I do believe that's it. Is that it? Can you really finish the sermon? That's breaking rules. Let's move on. All right. Join me, if you would, for a, a moment of prayer for a, a word today. Father, we come to you right now, and we thank you so much. Lord, just knowing that you, you love us so much. And in that love for us, you, you have displayed in your word, not just, Lord, a, a law to follow or rules to go by, but the great cost and sacrifice that is truly involved in love. And not just showing us that, Lord, but fulfilling every promise that you make. Seeing done everything in every word that you have said. And Father, even as we look at that today, Lord, we pray (laughs) that you be here with us and and that we be moved right now, even now, by your Holy Spirit and that you do these things in us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in Acts chapter 2. Last time we left off, you know, they had just um, had their first committee meeting, right? Uh, and they, they now have Matthias as their new apostle. And we talked about that in detail. And I just began to think as we were doing this, looking at Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 13. And, and I just began to kind of picture that in my head as I was looking at it, praying about it. And, you know, and, and, I, and I began to wonder as I did, you know, kind of rem- most of us, when we grew up, we grew up with either either in a Christian home or a non-Christian home. I grew up in a pseudo-Christian home. It was kind of like, you know, a, a little bit of Catholic with my mom's Protestantism thrown in, but neither one really good. Literally, my entire life, our family went to church twice. Once was a Christmas, and then once was an Easter. And they were spread out over the space of about five years or so. So... We didn't really go to church as a family and didn't really grow up in a religious attitude, so most of my religious ideas were gotten from people around me. And I began to wonder if some of these guys, knowing the, the requirements of the law that there are on growing up as a Jew in the first century, and, and knowing, too, the things that they believed, even that the Pharisees and the Sadducees taught. Remember, we have talked about that before. Some of the crazy things that these guys, even these guys, would have in their head of what Messiah was supposed to be. He was almost like a mythological superhero type figure that would come out of nowhere, have powers nobody else had ever shown before, you know, and, and would be a complete fulfillment of the law and would lead Israel to become the superpower of the earth, basically. But these guys come into this, and and they know everything they're supposed to be doing. They know everything that the Pharisees say. And then they see, you know, imagine these guys. Most of these guys were disciples of John, especially the apostles when they came to know him. And here they are. They're following John in. And John keeps telling them, there's somebody coming, guys. And imagine, you're sitting there thinking, John, you know, home dude eats bugs, right? Right? He's like so on fire for God that he will literally do anything, anything 
for God. And you're like, man, even my rabbi doesn't do that. My pa- you know, my pastor doesn't do that. This guy's on fire. And you're with him, and he says, there's a guy coming, man, who, who man, I, I don't even deserve to tie his shoes. He's that, he's that awesome. And he's, he's leading up and kind of letting you think that, okay, is he talking about Messiah? And then when Jesus comes, you see John the Baptist like totally flipping out, right? And you're like, oh, he's flipping out. we got to flip out, right? We're his disciples, and everybody's flipping out. And then he goes, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's huge. That's huge. To take away sin, somebody has to die. And it's a lamb. And he just called this guy a lamb. And then the guy walks up and, and you know, J to the B says, man, I, I, Lord, you should be baptizing me. And then it goes on. And it goes on. And many of these guys stopped following John and started following Jesus Christ. And half of these guys were probably anywhere from 14 to 20 years old. Remember, when you hit 13 then, you got bar mitzvah, right? And then they'd say, okay, time to start looking for a wife. By the time you were 14, many of them were married and already working for the family business. School was over. It was a hard life. And you had to start out young. Because most of your kids that you would have were going to die. Most everything that you were going to experience was going to be short-lived. <laughs> and then they start following Jesus. And this guy does things that they can't even begin to imagine. They can't, they've never imagined it would be like this. They see hands come where there was no hands. They see a guy that they grew up with as a cripple in the temple. You know, they knew him. They knew who he was. And they see Jesus touch this guy, and he just jumps up. Grabs his bed and starts walking. And what do the religious people do? They don't go, praise God. They go, you're breaking the rules. And they they see the complete difference in somebody that is so in love with God and so completely fulfilling everything he is. And remember, the rules that he was breaking weren't even the rules that were in the Scriptures. They were rules they made up so they wouldn't break the rules. We tend to do that. Well, I, I shouldn't do A, so I'm not even going to do, you know, point A. I'm not even going to come close to A so that I don't do A. But Jesus walks right up to people who are dirty, who are, who are messed up, who are sick, who are dead. And he either brings them back to life or restores them to where he wants them to be. You've been waiting your whole life for this guy. You've been... You know, your grandparents wanted this guy to come, and he comes, and then he dies, and everybody, man, and you forget everything, almost everything you ever said. You forget it. Because he died. It's not him. But he's come again. And you see him alive, and, and it blows your mind. And then he goes, and you're in this upper room with everybody, and Jesus comes up to everybody, and and he breathes on them. And at first, you're like, what is he doing? And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And everybody in that upper room that we read in the Gospel of John receives, they become saved at that very moment. Because remember, we talked about that. The Gospel is that mankind fell and God's Spirit was removed from him. But when you and I are born, we are born into sin. And now... Jesus is restoring that life of God back into mankind. When you believe in Him, His Holy Spirit enters into you, and you are saved at that very moment, eternally now. Saved. Not perfect, by no means. But saved. And then He says, Guys, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And as you and I know, that this is a controversial controversial subject today. So do me a favor. Let's, let's read the, the scriptures that we have before us. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. 
and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and, and, and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya uh, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, right? Even Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So now, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said they are full of new wine. Now, let's go back to verse 1, because as we begin to read, it says the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all together in one accord in one place. Now, that word Pentecost... In the Greek, it, it basically means 50th, right? And it was the 50th day. Um, it was held in the Jewish calendar on the 6th of Sivan, which for us is about June. And remember, we talked about that, that we couldn't exactly equate our days with their days because their first day of the year started when, what? When the barley was ready, Right? And what would they do? They would go and light a fire, and that would tell everybody, oh, flip the calendar. It's time. All right? The new year has begun. Okay? Um, one of the things that happened was at the end of this, they would make their grain offering. And in this grain offering, one of the things that they would do, and you can read about it in Exodus 23.16 and Leviticus 23.16, and they would count 50 days, Leviticus says, to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. So that's seven weeks plus a day, 50 days, okay? Now, the cool thing about this is when they would make that feast of first fruits, they would come and they would offer some sheaf of grain. But here they come and they offer two loaves. And those two loaves are actually loaves of bread. They're not loaves that have the leaven removed. Okay, that, that's a, a, something to point out and look at there. Now, um, you know, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And we talked about one accord before, right? They are in a room in a house just like before. Some people think it's the exact same house. Some people think it may even be the home that they took that last supper with Jesus in. Okay? Now, some commentators believe that they're actually in a room in the temple. Um, the reason I don't think that is because most of the archaeological data we have and the evidence that we have, most of the rooms were too small for 120 people sitting in, which is why some people change this to say only the apostles are here. But we're going to see some things later on that I, I don't think it's here because later on Peter is literally going to quote and say, you would see evidence of the Holy Spirit falling upon men and women. And we know the group that they were with in, at the end of chapter 1, were men and women, and he called them disciples, right? And we talked about that, that that was the first time, because you wouldn't call, as a Jew, you wouldn't call a woman a disciple, right? Because women couldn't learn, they could only listen. Remember, I didn't say that, that was what they said, right? But here, the home that they were in, and even the home that's accepted in tradition, was actually just outside of the temple. And one of the things that they could do you know, and, and that's one of the reasons that we think that so many people heard this noise and so many people came up is because it was close to the temple. Some even think it was right outside Solomon's portico. So a as they're doing this, they are in unity. They're together in one accord. Right? That doesn't mean it's perfect. That doesn't mean it's right. These guys have the same mind when they come together. 
And just like in Acts 4.31 that we're going to see later, they are all together in unity. It doesn't mean we even have to like each other. I don't even have to like you, man. But i got to love you. Right? It doesn't mean we have to be best friends. It doesn't mean we have to be best buddies. But you and I have a common love. We have a, we have a love in common that brings us together like nothing else should. And these guys come together because they saw a risen Savior tell them to do it. Isn't that awesome? And you and I have a risen Savior that has given us instruction. Here's how life works. And then just given it to us to do it. You know, not to do it to, to earn credit or favor with Him because that's been completed. We do it from love. And that's what these guys are here. They're here full of love and they're here to receive what God has for them. And then we see in verse 2, it says, suddenly a sound like the roar of a mighty windstorm coming from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And it's better translated there. Some of your translations may say, like a, like a. And that roar is comparable to like a tornado coming in. Okay? That's that sound. That's that decibel level that they think that it was. Have you ever heard a tornado come close to a home? It's scary. It is scary. You know, at being born and raised in North Carolina, you know, we've been, I've been around the block a couple of times with uh, hurricanes. And it sounds like a train going over the roof. Right? It's, it's just nuts, the sound. But here... This is one of the things that, that, that Luke is very descriptive of, and he says, like a, okay? It's like the roar of a mighty windstorm from heaven. And what does that tell us? That tells us it's not wind. You watch movies, and you see movies, and when it shows them getting the Holy Spirit, what happens? All their hair is blowing right, and the stuff's blowing around, and dust is flying, and they're all like, oh, and, and, you know, and, and it, that's not how it happened. They're sitting there, and it says, suddenly, you know? I know Jennifer would just have passed out, right? Because she'd just be, oh, boom, hit the ground, right? Because it was suddenly, suddenly there's this sound, man, and it fills the entire home that they're in. And it's mind-blowing because, it, you know, if you've heard, and, man, who, when do we not hear wind here in San Angelo, right? Sometimes you've you got to fight the door just to get it open. But here, that sound comes in, and it blows everybody's mind, right? Not just people in the house, but we're going to see later outside the house. Or we saw, you know, in 5 through 13, outside the house. There is no physical aspect given here. And, and as you read it, what we read, that same word wind is a root of the same word that they use for spirit, for blowing, right? For breath, that breath of life. And that same word, that, that neo in the scriptures that talks about wind, we have the spirit, which is pneuma. And, and when they when it tells us here that, that wind is blowing through, it sounds like wind. It, it, it's almost a hint for you and I to understand that when the supernatural, this is supernatural, guys. This is a supernatural event. And when the supernatural enters into this world as it is, it affects it, okay? Because it's beca it's doing something that is supernatural. But what do they not do? It doesn't say, you know, and, and you know, Lucas or Matthias jumped out of the window and everybody bailed and ran. It doesn't, that doesn't happen. Because something's going on that they're experiencing in this home where you and I would freak out and run they instead experience the opposite of that because it's not just a sound that's happening. It's, a, it's God encountering people and, and, and having a physical effect upon them. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, When you have God's spirit, it's not a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And that's self-control. So these guys don't flip out when the Holy Spirit comes in and most of us, if we were to see somebody, you know, getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, we would go, oh, ho, ho, they're in a cult. Get them out of here, right? But they don't do that. They are filled 
with the Holy Spirit and have self-control. And note, they didn't do anything to bring it except be obedient. They just did what God told them to do. They could have been playing canasta, right? And being obedient to what God had called them to do, and God showed up. There's no formula to get what they do here. Some of us, we look at this and we go, well, we need to be baptized in the Spirit. And it's like, brother, when you were saved, you were baptized in the Spirit. Granted, there was probably no tongues of fire that happened or anything like that, but His Spirit came to dwell within you when you did it because His Word says so. This is an incredible event. And we're going to talk about this in in a little more detail as we go. Okay? Because verse 3 tells us, again, it's not just sound, it's experience, it's something that's happening. And they see divided tongues as a fire and one sat upon each of them. And it uses that same descriptive word that you and I would use. You know, when we talk about, you know, the flames licking on a fire, and we, we would even call in our modern language, you know, the, the, the tongues of the flame as it, as it licked up the chimney. You know, we, it's what we do, right? And that's the descriptive imagery that he's using here. But notice he said that it, it divided itself, it separated itself. So when the, what they, and they see it, it says they saw, it appeared to them, divided tongues as of fire. They see this happening. They see, and, it, and the only way they can describe it is there was fire, and then little tongues, not little tongues, like, you know, blah, 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 tongues. It was tongues of flame. And, it, you know, I don't know if it danced or, you know, did a Disney thing and doo, 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 went to everybody. I don't know, or if it zapped them. Um, you know, th- these guys didn't have, like, disco balls and lasers. They didn't know how to describe this. They're describing it the best way that they can. And it just sounded like a tornado hit the room. There was a huge ball of flame, and little bits of flame shot out and was over each of our heads. That's all they can do. It reminds me of so many things in the Scriptures that we read where God spoke from a fire or acted from a fire. He spoke to Moses from what appeared to be a bush that was on fire, but yet not being consumed. It reminds me of Genesis chapter 15, verse 17, when Abraham was put asleep. And as he was put asleep, one of the things that happened with Abraham is he saw, you know, because God, remember, God was going to make a covenant with Abraham. And he had Abraham cut these animals in half. It was a common oath or a covenant that they would make during this time, they would basically cut the animals in half, and you know, and I'm talking about vertically, right? Not not just they would cut them in half, lay them on each side, and then each person making a covenant would walk between them. And when I would make this covenant, I'd basically be saying with you, if I break my part of the covenant, may what is going on with these animals be done to me, right? And God told Abraham to do this, knowing that he was going to make that covenant with him. Could you imagine Abraham's terror as he did that? (laughs) You know, I'm about to make a covenant with a God who's going to hold me accountable for this. But what happened? Abraham, he had to wait there so long and chase the animals away for so long that he fell asleep. And it became dark. And he saw... It says in chapter 15, verse 17, a smoking, a smoke, a smoking, a smoking oven and a burning torch. God took that covenant upon himself. He said he walked through that and then walked back through it. And he told it in telling in doing this, he told Abraham, I'm making a covenant with you. But if you blow it, then I'm going to die because you blew it. And we know that that was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful and amazing thing. But again, every time we see the fires of God interacting with mankind, it is a supernatural event. In Exodus 13.21, you know, that column of fire leads the people to deliverance. Stephen 
by the Holy Spirit would talk about that burning bush. Where God spoke as well. Hebrews 12.29 mentions that God, our God is a consuming fire. So here, you know, this these tongues of fire, again, the best way they can explain them, sets upon each one of them. And, and then it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, in chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus, if you look back at that, it says, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And we talked about that baptism. A baptism has a literal and a figurative meaning, right? The literal meaning is to be dipped, to be immersed, to be covered. And the figurative meaning is that you identify with what you're being baptized to. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance from sin and a renewal of commitment to the law. When you are baptized into the family of Christ, you identify with him. The scriptures even tell us that the baptism represents dying and then rising from the dead. Right? So here, you know, in chapter 2, they are so immersed that they are filled. In 4.8, Peter is going to say filled. In 4.31, they pray the house shakes this time, and they are filled again. And the fact that it talks about in the book of Acts, there's only one baptism that is talked about, and that's that initial one uh, that Jesus mentioned. The rest of the time when the Holy Spirit comes to them, it talks about a filling or being filled. Paul even talked about this in Ephesians 5.18. He told people, stop getting drunk with wine, which leads to wild living, but keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And that word in 5.18 is be being filled in the Greek. It's a continual process. And, and it's awesome because as you and I do it, we realize it's like, okay, I, I, can just, I can let that keep coming. I, I need it. I have to have that. I want it. I mean, who doesn't like refills, right? I, I know some of us, we go to the movies, and sometimes it's, we'll buy the permanent cup, you know, because I'm getting that, I'm getting that refill, man. Yeah, it's costing me $2, costing me 75 cents, bro. Refill, right? And then we'll literally, I might have to see this movie twice because I want to get a bunch of refills on my popcorn, and my, you know. <laughs> we love refills. And here, God says, I want you to be filled with my spirit constantly, constantly, constantly. And I want you to be filled. Not, not just to have the, the touchy-feelies or, you know, the little hairs standing up or, you know, Holy Spirit goosebumps, but to accomplish something. Every single time that they receive that filling, it's not to put on a show. It's to accomplish something that God has set out for them. Um, Stephen, in chapter 6, verse 8, when he's giving the gospel, it says that he was full of faith and power. Uh, uh, and it was so, the message was so powerful, they killed him for it. Do me a favor, turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And this is the end result of his sharing the gospel with these guys. Acts chapter 7, verse 54. Beginning with verse 54, it says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look! I, they couldn't see it, but he sees it. I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran at him with one accord. So this is probably like one of the only times they've really been in unity with each other, right? And, and, and what are they in accord with? They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as, as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down, cried out with a loud voice. The same thing he had learned from his master. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
point, you can turn back to chapter 2. Because us, most of us, wouldn't put up with that, right? We'd have been pulling pistols or, you know, we'd have been fighting back, doing some kung fu, something like that. But he doesn't do that. He literally goes to his knees in prayer and prays for these men that are killing him. You know, that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It doesn't mean that I can march around the, the, the sanctuary. It doesn't mean that I can fall down on the ground. It means that I can go and share the Gospel with people no matter what the cost. It means that I can live for Him and not for myself. It's a filling for confrontation in chapter 13, verse 52 of that. Barnabas, it says that you know he was just so full of love and so outreaching to people in chapter 11, verse 23 and 24. It's a condition that requires action. You know, we talked about this. It's not, a, it's not a title. It's not a, you know, I'm a Holy Ghost filled believer in Jesus Christ, you know. It's, I have the Holy Spirit and what do I do with it? He wants me to do something. It, it, it's that energy that He gives His warriors and robed with the power of God's armor in Ephesians chapter 6 because He says you put it on and that word that He uses in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the armor of God is permanent. It's permanent. I'm going to sleep in this stuff, right? Because my dreams are just as bad <laughs> as my wake. Because I need to be ready for battle. This in the tongues that they're talking here, the language that they are speaking, you know, in verse 4, they are filled with the Holy Spirit, begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It isn't the, you know, oh my, I bought a Hyundai kind of tongues that we're kind of used to, right? For many of us. And, and, and the one thing, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about tongues because the tongues that are happening here, uh, and, and this is something else I'm going to address in a little bit, is not the same gift that Paul talks about in, in Corinthians. Okay, This is a different event. And there are times when people receive the Spirit in the book of Acts where they don't speak in tongues. They're obviously saved, they obviously get it, but they don't speak in tongues. This is not the same thing. It is, but it is incredibly an incredibly supernatural event, and that's what we're going to get into. But talking about the gift of tongues as it is, um, as it's explained in the Scriptures, and I'm just going to spend a minute on this, okay? Should I spend a minute on anything? I don't know. All right? I'm not sure. Here's the deal, okay? And, and I'm not going to go into great detail on it. I'm just going to cover it just slightly. The gift of tongues isn't the gibberish ranting that most of us hear from many churches or from people. It's not, okay? It, it's, you know, because you've gone to people, and I remember um, going with a friend who gave his life to Jesus at, at a particular event, and we went in, the guy said, just start going, la, 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 and then God will take you there, right? Literally teaching him how to fake tongues, okay? Or what we call tongues. Um, and, and that's not what the gift of tongues is. It's a gift given to some according to the Scriptures. It's not a sign of salvation as some teach that it is. It is not. It is not a sign of that. And anyone that tells you if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved, is a fellowship or a teacher that should be avoided. I encourage you that in the Lord. I really do mean that. It is not a sign of salvation. In, in, in verses 5 through 13, we'll look at a little more at what is going on here. But as we are looking at this, one of the things that tongues is, is a language. It is a language that is not understood by the speaker that requires interpretation. This is one of the reasons that Paul says in Corinthians, let one speak in tongues, and, you know, at the most two or three, and let there be an interpreter. And if there is no interpreter, then nobody should speak in tongues. What does that mean for us? Practically, it means if we're having a meeting and somebody says, I have a tongue, and, and then we would say, okay, well, you know, or, or at what we call it again, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to note that at the end here, if somebody says they have that, then, okay, now we wait for an interpretation. If nobody stands up to interpret, then we say, okay, that was for you to the Lord, 
and we won't do any more because there's not an interpreter here. That's the practical application of, you know, administrating the gift of tongues within a fellowship. And we'll look at it a little more here. But this reminds me of Exodus chapter 3 when God spoke from the fire. But this is men and women, as we're going to see in verse 11, worshiping as they should. John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is a spiritual event. This is a spiritual happening. This is, this is not just a, 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 a... It is a sign. Don't get me wrong. It is a sign. But it is not just these guys faking it or these guys pretending. Let's look at the response, the crowd's response. In verse 5, they were... There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And we know that was called the diaspora. And, and they literally were from the known world. There were Jews almost anywhere that there was a civilization. Um, and, and for many of them, for some of them, the only time they would ever come back to Jerusalem, and some of them were only able to come once in their life simply because they could not afford it, the only time they would come back is for the required feast. So most of them that are here, some of them may even have been living in Jerusalem for months because, you know, you didn't have the time and the inclination. You know, you couldn't just hop in a plane and, you know, head over to Mesopotamia and be good, right? It would take you weeks to travel and cost, you know, in, in our dollars, thousands of dollars to make that trip. So many of these guys, they would say, you know, they would save up enough money and go, hey, we're moving to Jerusalem for, you know, four months to do the required feast or five months. And then they would go live there and then go back and then start saving up for the next time where they would, Lord willing, be able to come again. So there's guys from all different nations, it tells us. And then let's look at verse 6. And when this sound occurred, okay, so now it's telling us from the other side what's happening here. This is how the people outside the house perceived it. When the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all those who speak Galilean? And then it goes, and then he says, How is it we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And then it names. 15 places that everybody is from and then goes in verse 11 we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God all right so looking at that section right now look at how Luke describes the reactions I want you to understand that there's something amazing going on here okay number one the crowd gathers and it says they're confused amazed they marvel verse 12 says they were amazed and perplexed in the Greek, that uh, that suncheo, to, to trouble or to confuse, to stir up, it's existimi, uh, a, a sense of amazement. He uses that word twice, you know, so that's two different words. And then he uses tamazo, right, Wh which is to wonder at, to marvel. And then he uses uh, diaporeo, uh, which means to be thoroughly perplexed. He uses four words to describe the craziness going on in their minds as they witness this event. Guys, we have to understand as we're looking at this, <laughs> would you really be blown away if you walked upon a group of people? And remember, most people at this time in the first century, even the backwoods people like the Galileans, would speak multiple languages. Most of them would speak Ar you know, Aramaic because that was pretty much the dominant language. Perhaps Hebrew because they had to learn it to you know do certain things. But even now, most people that get you know, that, that go through their Hebrew school, basically memorize it, have no idea what they're saying. Um, they would speak Greek because that was the trade language that many of the Romans even would speak. They would speak Latin because they were taken over by Rome, and that was also a good language to know. So most of these guys would know multiple languages. So why would you be perplexed at that? Why would they be perplexed at that? Why would that be so mysterious and so amazing and blow them away? 
the Greek here in Acts 2.8 says, so how is it that each one of us hears them, and that's a collective whole, speaking in his own native language? They are hearing all 120 people speak in their own native tongue. I'm not hearing them speak in Italian, Phrygian, um, Latin, Aramaic, and I'm hearing every single one of them speak in my native language that I grew up with. Remember, it says that these were Jews coming from, and proselytes coming from all over the world. Myself, I probably would have heard them speaking in bad English because that's my native language, right? Yeah, there you go. So I, I, just out of the 15 places they mentioned, you're talking about 15 different languages, or as many as 50, because it says people from all over the world, and yet each one of the people listening hears them speaking in his language, and then I would look at the guy next to me and go, you know, they're talking in Phrygian, they're talking in Latin, and the person would go, no, 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 they're talking in, and then it becomes a thing where they become perfectionist. How can these people do this? You know, they're just Galileans, aren't they? How are they? How are they pulling this off? What is it that they are doing here? This reminds me of another event. Anybody know where we're going? Hold your place here and turn to Genesis chapter 11. It reminds me of this because I think it's just a beautiful thing. It, it, it's just another thing of God reminding us, you know, he, he, he fulfills his promise. And he wants to have fellowship with you so bad. Genesis chapter 11, looking at verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And they said, <laughs> Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. Jump to verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men have built. Verse 6. The Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Verse 7, Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So you can turn back to Acts. And just to think of that, man, the fact that there was a language that was shared that was common to everyone. And, and, you know, does that mean that these guys are speaking some weird, mystical, spiritual language that has been forgotten and that man can understand if he hears it, but we just don't know how to speak it unless prompted by the Holy Spirit? I don't know. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is each one of them has now... Has, it's reversed what happened with Babel. Instead of God confusing languages and doing things, He says, with my spirit in you, you are once again able to come to a point of unity, to gather together and to have one mind and to have one focus because our focus is not Calvary Chapel. My focus is not, you know, can this help my business? My focus is not, can I find a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband or a wife? My focus is Jesus Christ. And with that, I now have reversed everything. I'm no longer walking under the Tower of Babel, and I can join with these people, and you and I can follow Jesus Christ filled with His Holy Spirit. And what do these people hear? Praise. They don't hear them, you know, shouting the law. They don't hear them condemning. They hear them praising, shouting the wonderful works of God. You know, and, and imagine when you hear that, because some of us will go, well, if they, weren't, if they aren't saved yet, then how could they be having a supernatural experience? John chapter 5, verse 25. Jesus says, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead, the dead, will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. The dead can hear God. You and I, we, we think that a dead man can't react to anything. But remember, God can speak to the dry bones and they'll live. You and I have to understand 
the voice of the Son of God is life. And they are declaring the wonderful works of God. They're, they're not speaking on their own. They're worshiping in spirit and in truth. And you see, when we get caught up in that, when you and I begin to worship as we should, we do the same thing. Most people think this is a dig. I don't think it's a dig. I think they're just simply pointing out these guys are just from Galilee. They're not holy holy guys. They're not Pharisees or Sadducees or a bunch of rabbis. They're nobodies. And yet, this incredibly supernatural, spiritual, holy thing is going on. I want I, you know I don't think they walked out with like tongues ah, you know shouting to everybody I don't think that happened you know which would be crazy that's you know like you know they're not like Goku Dragon Ball Z kind of thing going on with fiery hair and stuff that's not what's happening here they see people that they know to be normal to be everyday guys and they see a supernatural event going on they experience it in their own lives. And most of these guys are from Galilee, especially the apostles, the leaders, you know. How can God use such simple people to do such supernatural, amazing things? And do you know what day this is happening on? Pentecost. And what day did Pentecost fall on? Sunday. What day did Jesus rise from the dead? Sunday. That's one of the reasons that the early church began to meet on Sunday. That's one of the reasons we meet on Sunday. Every Sunday we come in here, we celebrate a risen Savior. And here, not only does the Savior come, He fills them. The church is born this day, as we see it. But this is a baptism. And He identifies to every single person there. He reminds them that they are His. And He shows this to Israel. They belong to Him. Peter says this in Acts 2.18, on my men servants, and he's quoting Joel, on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. In Acts 2.33, he says, therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, they have received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out this, which you now see and hear. beautiful and it's amazing. In verse 12 it says they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking, saying they are full of new wine. So perhaps some hear it in their own native language and it doesn't matter to them because they don't really worship God. They don't care. You know, For anybody to be singing at this time of day, worshiping God, they're probably just drunk. Right? That's what some people would say because they don't care. They're not, they don't believe. They, they don't care. And blind is blind, man. The Holy Rollers saw miracle after miracle, right? The preaching of the Word. God coming in and changing things. People, you know, and we talked about this. It was one of the signs that only Mashiach could do, okay? The Messiah would come in and, and somebody that, was, that had a demon in them who was born blind, couldn't speak and couldn't hear, only Messiah could heal them. Because remember, you know, it was said that to cast a demon out, you had to know the demon's name, et cetera, et cetera. And, and someone that was deaf, dumb, and blind couldn't respond. Only somebody full of the power of God, and they believed Messiah would be able to cast a demon out of someone. And Jesus came, and he was like, here you go. Who am I? And they said, you're the devil, right? But that's what we do when somebody doesn't fit what we think is supposed to be and what is supposed to happen. They accused him of being the devil and plotted, not just accused him, but plotted to kill him, Matthew 12, 22-30. These guys aren't doing what you're supposed to do in church. What is going on? Right? And they don't. In closing, Peter responds. If you want to look there at verse 14. Peter, standing up with the eleven raised his voice and he says to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for they are not drunk as you suppose. It is only the third hour of the day. But this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he goes into a sermon. 
able to assume us. That will convict us all. We're not going to go. We'll go through that next week, Lord willing. But this is a supernatural event, guys. This is a baptism that would never happen again as it did. If there's any of you that have been baptized with the Holy Spirit where tongues of fire appeared over your head and it sounded like a train was in your house, let me know because you're an incredibly special person and I'd like to know you. All right? So this, and it never happens like this again, even in the Scriptures. And, and, and I truly do believe that this is because you and I being filled with the Holy Spirit is not supposed to be formulaic. It's not supposed to be a formula. It's the Spirit. Jesus, when He described it, said, the wind goes where it wants. And you don't know where it's going to go. So He's the same with the Spirit. And for you and I begin to begin to think that we can control God or we have a handle on the Holy Spirit or I can, you know, I can pass out this gift as I want. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's a hubris that I, I don't want to fall into myself. Because that kind of pride can bring a fall as sure as this. For some people, man, they, they, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've heard people describe it as oil falling upon them. I've heard some people describe it feeling like little bugs crawling all over them. In a good way, not in a like real creepy way. Right? For some people, I've heard them describe it as though weight is lifted off their shoulders. Do you remember the first time that you experienced the Spirit in your life? And you were just like, oh. I can remember that first moment, man, when everything was lifted off of me. And I knew at that very moment, not only that I was saved eternally, but that there was a God in the universe who loved me. And I entered into a perfect fellowship with Him. Not because of me, because of Him. Many in Acts receive the Spirit, and it's very obvious from other places in the book of Acts. And, they don't, and, and again, we call it tongues, because that's kind of what we named it, Right? And that's part of the issue that I have with this because technically it's translated languages. And that's a part of the issue that I have with some of the presuppositions that you and I come to with the Scriptures sometimes because you and I believe that it should be this. You know, it should be this. And we transliter- transliterate the words instead of translate them. Instead of translating glossia as languages or language, we translate it as tongues. When you read it, without transliterating, but actually translate the word, it totally changes the way you see so many of the Scriptures. If you if you have a, a Bible version, um, a, a good translation, I think, of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, um, I, I like uh, the ISV, if you've ever heard of it. I think you can find it free online. Um, I'm not sure about the ESV. The one that really impacted me was the ISV because it translated glossia instead of as tongues as language, and it totally changes the reading of it, okay? You and I, we come into this, and and this is a gift that is different from salvation. This occurrence, this supernatural thing, these guys, we talked about that in the book of John. Jesus has already breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They are already saved. This is not a salvation moment. These guys are already saved. And the fillings that they occur. So are they getting saved every time the Holy Spirit fills them later on in the book of Acts? No. It's not a salvation experience. Okay? This is God filling them and giving them that filling. When you and I get saved, Paul describes it in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. It says, In Him you have trusted. You trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation completely, totally, totally. He says, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is our guarantee, and we talked about that, that word guarantee is what? It's the same word that was used for engagement ring. It's your your engagement ring that God put on you saying you're his bride. It's the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. And when He put that ring on us, He said, You are mine. And Jesus said, Nobody can take you out of His hand. The 
Holy Spirit as it comes here is a power, a, a, an injection, if you were to say, to accomplish His will on earth. And at no time is the Holy Spirit spoken of as coming in this manner again. But over and over and over again, the church in the book of Acts needs a filling of the Holy Spirit. But I guess we don't anymore, do we? You and I don't need it anymore, right? Or do we? Do we? Why? We, we, we have the complete Bible. We have seminaries. We, have, we can get doctorates in theology. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Should my child be filled? And then he gives them power to do things when they go, oh, Lord, I can't do it. For those of you that may struggle with sharing the gospel with people, and you go, well, that's not me. And he says, exactly right. Let me do it through you. And he'll do it through you in unique ways. I'm not saying all of you are going to be, we're not going to be carbon copies of each other. We're not even carbon copies of Jesus, though he is our goal and standard. But he needs to fill you with that. And not just once, but over and over and over again. Our God is a God of miracles, and He wants to do them in you and through you. Let's pray. Father, as we come to You right now, Lord, we thank You so much for the gift of Your Holy Spirit that You have given. And Father, as we come to You today, Lord, if there is any here who does not know You, I pray, Lord, that they would come to know You now. Father, if there is anyone here who, who has struggled with believing in who You are, who has struggled with truly trusting You when they hear the Gospel, I pray that they have heard today that they can trust You and that You still will act upon their life, that You want to fill them with Your Holy Spirit and that, that You want to give them the assurance and the comfort of their salvation. And with all eyes closed right now, if I could, if there's anyone here, if you're not sure in your heart of hearts, that you truly are a believer in Jesus Christ and you would want to be saved, would you raise your hand right now? Okay. Father, for those of us, Lord, who are just coming before you, I pray that you would fill each and every person here with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would do a work in them, an amazing work, a true work, Lord, uh, not one that would be a show and circumstance, but one that would enable them to live the life you've called them to live. Father God, that they would see miracles done in their life, that they would walk in faith in your word, um, that they would, the things that you say to do in your word, that they would take action upon and, and, and see you, see you, Lord, in their life. So many times, Father, our walks become stale or dry, and many times, Lord, it's because we're, we're just doing, we're going through the motions. And Father, I lift every person here up to you, that you would give them the assurance, the complete assurance and confidence of their salvation being totally entrusted to the work of Jesus Christ, what He has done. And in doing that, Lord, be free to walk in obedience to you by the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that only you can do in us. Help us, Lord, to love one another as you love them. That's one of the evidences that you really are in us. Lord, I lift everyone here up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I know some of you can't make it on Wednesdays, um, but if you can, um, you know, I would encourage you to pray about being here at third Wednesdays. Uh, and, and we're, you know, for, I know some of you have a very difficult time making it here in the evening. So I am praying about a Sunday where we can come together and have a time where we allow the works of the Holy Spirit to be displayed here. Because to not do it is to quench the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to do that. Uh, we don't want to prevent that work being done here. But we want to do it in a good order and by Him. Um, if you would, rise with me. And, and we're going to uh, do the most liturgical thing we do here, right? We're going to do the benediction. Just because we love it, not because we're being obedient to something, right? Because it's just so awesome. I love this. Okay, guys, ready? We've got a lot of guys here today, so it should be booming. 
The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. His countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have an awesome day in the Lord. God bless you guys.